So now we're going to talk about the respiratory system. And I really enjoy the respiratory system because I think it's really amazing how oxygen makes it from external air to internal air and through the body and then it's expelled again as carbon dioxide. So I'm going to repeat a question that I already asked on the previous version of this video. And that is, how much oxygen is in the air, in the air that you inhale? 21.5%. That's pretty good. So how much oxygen is in the air that you exhale? 5%. 12. You're closer than he is. 13. You're closer than he is. It's actually between 16 and 17%. So if you think about it, the amount of oxygen that you inhale and that's picked up by your body and then that you exhale, there's not a huge change there. So that's why mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilations and CPR work, because when you exhale 16% oxygen, you're still putting enough oxygen into that person's body that they can pick up the oxygen, oxygen that they need. And when they exhale, they're still going to blow out oxygen. Right? Right. Okay. So, like I said, I really like the respiratory system, but before we can talk about how the respiratory system works, we need to have a pretty good understanding of how the respiratory system is built. So, this is where you get to watch my drawings. Will you make sure that that's pointed at this screen, because it seems like it's a little high. It is a little high. There you go. Is that good? Yep. All right. Okay. So, I am not a master artist, so you're going to get what you get, and don't throw a fit. Okay? All right. So, we have our head here, right? And I'm putting his eyeball here, and this is his nose, and his nose, nose hole. <laughs> then we have his mouth, and he comes down and he has a chin. Okay? Mm -hmm. Eyeball, eye. All right. Now, behind his nose is a big open space. So this is his, nas his nose, or his nares, and his nasal passage right here, okay? This is a big open space. There's stuff in it. You've got some sinuses and stuff in it. And you've got, as you know, the vulmar, which is that bone right there in the middle. See? That's in there. But for the most part, it's fairly open. And this space is called your nasopharynx. Okay? You have the same type of space behind your mouth. Kind of a fairly large open space. This is our lips. Okay? Um, and you have a tongue down here. And your tongue goes all the way down into the back of your throat like this. But you have a pretty large open space back here. And this space is called your oropharynx. Now you'll notice that naso equals nose, oro equals oral. Okay? Nasopharynx, oropharynx. And where those two cavities meet, this space right here, which I'm coloring black for absolutely no reason because it shouldn't be black, because then you can't read what I write there. This space right here is called your pharynx. Why is it important to know the difference between all of those parts of the anatomy? I mean, if we just stop right there, why do we need to know the difference? Well, I'll tell you why, okay? We have a couple of different ways that we can maintain an open airway. What's one of the ways that we use to maintain an open airway? Those nasal something right here now. Yeah, those weird things that you put in your nose that you guys are going to get to practice when we get to chapter 10 and we're on airway management. Okay? But the first way is actually, it's not invasive at all. We do a head tilt chin lift. Now, what does a head tilt chin lift do for us? Opens up the air passages. How does it do that? Just puts them in line. Puts them in a line, and guess what else it does? It moves it, the tongue out of the way. It moves the tongue out of the way, because our tongue is laying back here, and it's going to kind of fall, it, it can fall, into our pharynx. 
okay, because it's attached right here. So the tongue can fall into our pharynx. So if we do a head tilt chin lift, we pull the tongue away from the back of the throat. So what's the other non-invasive way that we'd use to open the airway? <clears throat> that jaw one? That jaw, jaw one? Thrust. Pardon? Jaw thrust. Jaw thrust, yep. How does a jaw thrust work? Pulls the jaw forward, which would pull the tongue forward. Yeah, pulls the jaw forward, which pulls the tongue away from the back of the throat. So a head tilt, chin lift, and a jaw thrust do essentially the same thing. They pull the tongue out of the way. Yeah, but don't you do the jaw thrust when there's like a suspected spine injury? So we only use a head tilt, chin lift if we don't think there's any spinal injury. Is it any spinal injury or just like a neck or um, cervical it's spine? It's mostly neck, but if you have a person who has a spinal injury somewhere, they're likely going to need to be in a collar, which means you should be treating them like they have a neck injury anyway. Once you put a collar on, don't you basically eliminate the ability to do either one of those? You eliminate the ability to do a head tilt chin lift, but you should still be able to do a jaw thrust. Because your fingers, your uh, thumbs or your fingers to pull up are going behind the curve of the jaw. So the C collar should affect your ability to do that. <clears throat> okay. So then we use a jaw thrust if we do have suspicion of a spinal injury. All right. So on our little guy here, I'll give him some hair just because he looks kind of bald. And an ear. Okay. So on our little guy here, once we leave the pharynx, we have a little leaf-shaped flap of tissue right here. Do you know what that little leaf-shaped flap of tissue is called? Epiglottis. It's the epiglottis. And what is the job of the epiglottis? Keep food from going down your esophagus. Or not esophagus. Prevents food and liquid from entering the airway. Prevents food and liquid from entering the airway. So right about here, our airway, which was, it did have two responsibilities, right? It had a responsibility for, responsibility for starting the digestive process, and it also had the responsibility for inspiring or inhaling air. So right about here, we split into two. Okay? And when we split into two, on one side we have the Esophagus. Esophagus. And on the other side we have the larynx. Trachea. Trachea. The larynx is right here. It's also right here, okay? And then we have the trachea and the esophagus. In this particular rendering, I don't care about the esophagus because the esophagus is part of the digestive system. It's not part of the respiratory system. Okay? And our larynx continues. Our larynx continues until we reach what anatomical structure? Trachea. Or no larynx. There's two pieces of cartilage right here. Oh. <clears throat> and that's where your vocal cords are located. Do you know what this piece of cartilages are? Uh, tri trichoid. Yeah. And I don't know what this other word is. Uh, cricoid. Cricoid cartilage. Cricoid and oh, the thyroid cartilage. Yep, cricoid and thyroid cartilage. Ah, uh, is good. Okay, and you can feel the cricoid and thyroid cartilage in your own trachea if you want to. Right, mine's right here. If you just move your tongue up and down, you can feel it there. Okay? In the middle of the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage is the cricothyroid membrane. If a person has to have an airway cut in the field, it's usually cut right here, right in that soft spot in between the, the cricoid and the uh, thyroid cartilage. You can feel that membrane, that spot right there too when you're talking. <clears throat> Now, once we get past the cricoid and thyroid cartilages, 
By the way, what's located here? What other anatomical structure is located here? Super, super important. You can't talk without them. Your vocal cords. I was going to say that. Pardon? I was going to say that, but I didn't figure that was the actual Me too. name of them. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, so we have your cricoid and thyroid cartilage and your vocal cords. <clears throat> your vocal cords are, they're basically, they, they, when you look at them, they look like a couple of sheets of plastic, but they're very thin membranes that vibrate at very high frequencies. And because they vibrate at very, very high frequencies, they allow air out to make noise. Okay? We will get down a mannequin later and we'll look at the, um, the vocal cords. Okay? Actually, would you mind helping me, Scott? Yeah. small version of an airway. I don't know if you can see this or not, but right in here, there's, you can see the vocal cords. There's little white lines inside there. Yeah? Okay. So, this is your tongue. This is your epiglottis. This little flap of tissue right here is your epiglottis. Okay? And then you continue down into the larynx. This is your cartilage. And your vocal cords are right inside that cartilage. Right there. You see them? So let's pretend our person is laying on their back. How's that? Can you see him in there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so down this little tube where our vocal cords are at, we continue on our journey. We're going to continue into the world of the lungs. And at the bottom of the trachea, our, our tube bifurcates. Bifurcates means it splits in two. And we have um, a tube that goes to the left, and we have a tube that goes to the right. And you'll notice that I didn't draw them at the same angle. And I didn't draw them at the same angle for a reason. Okay? The left main stem bronchi, <coughs> that's this one, that's an L with a circle on it, in case you can't tell. Looks like a deathly hollow, but it's not. <clears throat> so the left main stem bronchi has to go at not quite as sharp of an angle as the right main stem bronchi. Why is that? Holy lords. Because the heart is sitting right there? Because the heart is sitting right here. What else is sitting right here, Beach? Maybe a better question is, tell me a little bit more about the lungs. About the lungs? Yeah. The left one a little bit smaller than the right one. The left one's a little bit smaller than the right one. Why? Because you got a heart? Because you got a heart there. But that heart <laughs> also means that your lungs are shaped just a little bit differently. So let's pull this mannequin out, because he'll be able to talk to us a lot better. He doesn't actually talk. Okay. This is my old guy. His teeth are coming out. All right. So let's take a look at these lungs. What's the difference between them? One sits lower than the other. Pardon? One sits lower than the other. It sits a little bit lower. There's actually the veins on it. There's the three one? lobes on this <laughs> lung. Okay? There's three lobes on this lung and there's two lobes on this one. 
Okay, so your left lung has fewer lobes than your right lung. I'm going to put him next to you, okay? Sounds good. Just in case I need to grab him again. Mm -hmm. His teeth are like in upside down and backwards. Okay. <clears throat> so when we draw our lungs, our left lung, which I'm going to draw the lung here, and then we'll move on over there to do a better rendition of it. Our left lung and our right lung have different lobes. <clears throat> now, our left lung only has two lobes because it's a little bit smaller because our heart's right there. Our heart being right there is kind of important. When we talk about how circulation works, we'll talk about how the heart pushes blood through the body. But for now, we're going to talk about the lungs. And I'm going to move this drawing right over here for a little bit. Now, your lungs are shaped similar to this. Obviously, this is not exact because I'm not an artist. Um, we have a heart here. We've got different lobes of our lungs. We've got bronchi, our right left main stem bronchi going in like this. Okay. <clears throat> Once our bronchi start to enter our lungs, they get even smaller and they become bronchioles. And our bronchioles go to every part of our lung. Okay. They go to every part of our lung where they become alveoli. And alveoli are little grape-like structures at the end of the bronchioles. There are millions and millions and millions of alveoli in your lungs. And alveoli is where the gas exchange happens that allows for oxygenation of the blood. So we have this cluster of alveoli right here, okay? We're going to call that our cluster of alveoli, which are at the end of our bronchioles. And we have blood, our capillary beds, that flow in and around our alveoli. So we've got blood coming in. And we've got blood going out. And I have them labeled different colors just because I do. I was going to tell you that it's because they're that are oxygenated and not, but I put the wrong color in the wrong direction. Let me fix it because it makes more sense that way. little grape-like structures which are alveoli. And our alveoli live at the end of our bronchioles. And when blood comes to our alveoli, it comes to our alveoli and it's deoxygenated. So if you think about your skin, like you can see your veins under the surface of your skin because your blood is blue. Blue blood means it doesn't have any oxygen in it. So when the blood comes to the alveoli, it's deoxygenated. And as the blood crosses over the alveolar surface, it becomes oxygenated. Red blood has oxygen in it. Okay? Now, in order for oxygen to pass across the alveolar membrane, what has to happen? That's our alveolar membrane. What has to happen in order for oxygen to cross the alveolar membrane? Perfusion. Well, that's the process. <clears throat> this Wait, process is called diffusion. Oh, that's okay. diffusion. Okay. Yeah. Perfusion is your body's ability to get blood and oxygen to all of its tissues. Okay. Okay. Diffusion is the process of moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. Okay, so when our blood is moving across the alveolar wall, it comes here with CO2 in it. Okay, and it hits blood, it hits the alveoli which have oxygen in them, right? So the, the oxygen is out here, 
And in order for this to work, the oxygen says, I really want to be where that CO2 is at because there's not very many, many of me over there. I want to go be a part of that house over there. And so the oxygen moves across the alveolar wall until there's the same amount of oxygen on both sides. So now I've got three oxygen on this side and three oxygen on that side. So they're equal. All right. Well, carbon dioxide does the same thing. It doesn't want to be left behind. So it's like, hey, there's no carbon dioxide out there. I better move over there. So carbon dioxide moves across the alveolar wall as well. Make sense so far? Okay. Now, in order for this gas exchange to occur, the alveolar wall has to be at least semi-permeable. What can keep that alveolar wall from being permeable? Paint? Yeah, paint could. What else? Dust. Dust? What about asthma? Do you think asthma could keep the alveolar wall from being permeable? Okay. We're going to pretend that this is an, is an alveoli. Okay? And our alveoli always have a little bit of air in, it, in them. They're never flat. So this is our alveolar, or this is our alveoli. And if you look at this alveoli, you can tell that the alveolar wall is still pretty thick. It's a dark pink color. You can feel that it's thick. I mean, it feels like a pretty thick alveoli, right? You laugh, but this is going to make better sense. You can laugh, but it'll make better sense, I promise. Okay, so when you take a big breath in, your alveolar wall. Thin. It thins out. When it thins out, the alveolar wall becomes more permeable because it's got a greater surface area. Okay? When it has a greater surface area, let me show you something. I'm going to need all your hands up here, guys. Sorry. Come here. I need your hands. Come here. Just come here. So these are capillaries. This is your capillary bed surrounding your alveoli, okay? As the air goes out of the alveoli, the capillary beds don't leave. Keep your hand on it. But they get all closer together. So gas exchange at the same rate can't happen because your capillaries are all collapsed in there together. So in order for gas exchange to happen appropriately, we have to refill our alveoli. Okay? All right. Huh. I like the balloon demonstration. <laughs> I think the balloon demonstration makes perfect sense. I thought asthma sense. was like the bronchi. Bronchi, yeah, or bronchioles. Bronchioles, like uh, swelling shut. It is, yeah. But it does something to the alveoli. It yeah. can keep the alveoli from being able to inflate completely because the bronchioles swell shut. Because then there's not enough air getting in there? There's not enough air getting in there. Yeah. Okay. So this is my way up in the top level version of the anatomy and part of the physiology of the respiratory system. Okay. This, this little spot right here, this is called the carina. And down in, down underneath the bottom of the lungs, we have a muscle. It's a dome-shaped muscle. And this dome-shaped muscle helps us to breathe. And this is called the diaphragm. Okay. The way that breathing works is through negative pressure. Through negative pressure. So, inhalation is an active process. 
What does that mean? You're flexing the muscle to inhale. Yeah. You are flexing a muscle to inhale. So when you inhale, this muscle, instead of being domed, it actually becomes a flat muscle. That muscle contracts, your chest wall opens up, and you have a decrease in pressure. That decrease in pressure in your lungs causes you to pull air in from the outside, like a vacuum cleaner. Okay, a vacuum cleaner creates a decrease in pressure, and that decrease in pressure causes you to suck stuff up. So it comes constantly every time you breathe, it goes big and then flat every yep. single time? Yep, every single time you breathe, your diaphragm is working. Every single time. Every time you breathe in, your diaphragm is lowering. Every time you breathe out, it's going back into that arched position. Okay? Your diaphragm is not the only muscles that it's not the only muscle that's helping you breathe, but by far and large, it is the biggest one. Okay? Remember when we were talking about our ribs and how our rib cage expands? <clears throat> Our rib cage expands in order to help us breathe, right? We've got muscles all over in here. And these are called intercostal muscles. These intercostal muscles help your lungs, your chest wall to expand to also help you breathe. But they're not quite as important as your diaphragm. Okay. Okay. Cool. So this diaphragm right here, have you ever heard the phrase getting the wind knocked out of you? Yeah. You don't actually get the wind knocked out of you. What happens is, whatever has caused it, has caused your diaphragm to spasm. Have you ever had a spasm of a muscle? Mm -hmm. Hurts like hell, right? Yeah. Yeah. So whatever, however you got hit, whatever, it causes your diaphragm to spasm. And until your diaphragm can figure out how to fix itself, it takes a couple seconds, you feel like you can't breathe. Make sense? Yep. Okay. So, somebody in your own words, tell me how inhalation works. Inhalation works by the diaphragm contracting, which creates lower pressure in your lungs, which draws in air. And then the process of, what was it, diffusion? Diffusion, right? Occurs. Correct. This process of diffusion that happens right here at the alveolar wall is called external respiration. Why is this called external respiration? Because things are going out of it. Pardon? Because it's like going out of it to make it oxygen. So it's like ex, like exiting kind of thing. Uh, Does that make sense? Maybe. But it's really because the inside of your alveoli are open to the outside world. Yeah, that's what I meant. That's what I try to do. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Like the inside of your into alveoli mm -hmm. are open to the outside world. So it's called external? External, yep. External what? Respiration. Respiration. Respiration is the exchange of gases across the membrane. So external respiration happens in your alveoli. Hmm. Cool. Okay. All right. We discussed how inhalation works. How does exhalation work? The diaphragm relaxes and creates a higher pressure in the lungs, which pushes air out. Exactly. The diaphragm relaxes, which creates a higher pressure in the lungs, and it pushes the air out. So, inhalation is an active process. Exhalation is a passive process. Your body does it on its own. Hmm. Okay? Okay. Question, <clears throat> kind of along the lines. Hyperbaric chambers and that for healing, is they basically put 100% oxygen in there? At a higher pressure. How does that, what is the effect on that? Because this is saying 79% nitrogen is what you're exhaling and all that. If you're exhaling 100% oxygen, inhaling, how do you? You won't be it? exhaling 100% oxygen because well, you I have to get rid true, of waste yeah. products. So 3 to 5% carbon dioxide, but yep. no nitrogen because it's all oxygen in there, right? Right. So... Hyperbaric chambers work because they're a higher pressure, and because they're a higher pressure, they can force more oxygen into the bloodstream. So it increases oxygenation to the injured parts of the body. And that increase in oxygenation is said to help with healing. Does it force your body to make more white blood cells? 
I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Okay, so now we have oxygen on board, right? And we kind of need to talk about the circulatory system, but I really wanted to stick to the respiratory system. So let's just say that our oxygen, I'm going to erase this guy. Is everybody okay with me erasing this guy? All right, because, you know, he's such a beautiful model. Oh, yeah, before I erase him. At some point, we switch from the upper airway to the lower airway. What point is that? Uh, after the larynx? Yeah, right here. This nice little divide right here is where we switch from the upper to the lower airway. Lower. It's going to be important for you to know that because some of the diseases and disorders of the airway occur only in the upper airway, and some of them occur only in the lower airway. Where does asthma happen at? Lower. Lower, yeah, because it happens in the bronchioles, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about... Croup. Croup? Croup. Is it what I have? Oh, that's the moment here. Or we could say epiglottitis, but that's kind of a giveaway. Croup and epiglottitis are not the same thing. Want to go with upper? Yeah, epiglottitis happens in the upper airway. Isn't that where the epiglottis just swells up? Yep, inflammation of the epiglottis. But that inflammation of the epiglottis, children's airways are smaller than adults, and that inflammation of the epiglottis can cause their airway to close. So what is croup? Uh, croup is, it's an illness that causes a high-pitched, like a, almost like a seal. Mm -hmm. Not quite like whooping cough, but... So it's just something in there swelling up? Right, and it's usually upper airway. Oh, you know what I did forget? I forgot, and I think I can do it on this one, so I hope I, hope I can. Okay, around your lungs is a lining. Around pretty much everything in your body, there's a lining, okay? And around your lungs is this lining that's called a pleura. Okay? And this lining...